This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Spectra 1964, Atom Audio, Isotope, Jay-Z Microphones, and Solid State Logic. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z V12 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100D Mic Pre and C610 complimenter with Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. So please remember to check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes below. It's a great way to help support this show. And now, get ready to rock. I go back and I just go, where did this all come from? You know, it's like you get this thing, you get this fire going and you have to get it through. That's why you don't want to be the groove buster in a session. You don't want to say, oh, we got to go, we got to stop or, 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 one of the things that Jimmy said is he'd never, never tell somebody they could do a better job. Just say, that sounded really cool. You want to do another one? Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. It's amazing that we can create professional mixes using a computer in our home studios, but trying to mix with a mouse, it's like trying to play the guitar with the tip of a pencil. It sucks. And why shouldn't you be able to mix as naturally as you play the guitar? That's why I upgraded my studio to include the SSL UF8 fader pack and UC1 channel strip controllers. They let me mix as fast as I can feel the music. Go put the fun back into your mixes at solidstatelogic.com. Atom Audio introduces the all-new A7V monitor with rotatable HPS waveguide for the accelerated ribbon tweeter and advanced onboard DSP-based room correction using the included A-Control software or optional Sonarworks software with a measurement mic, allowing you to tune your speakers for your room, your mix position, and your ears anytime you want. Get the extended five-year warranty for monitors that will improve Improve as your studio improves at AdamAudio.com. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Paul Wolf, and I'm going to read you a little bit of his bio in his own words because it's pretty cool. And as Paul says, in 1972, I was hanging out at a local TV shop. A guy comes in with a strat with no sound. The shop owner had no clue. I pulled the jack out and fixed it. The guitar player said, from now on, your name will be Fix. That was the beginning of my course on the road to the studio and to designing. Both parents were in big bands during the 1940s, and later my father was a civil engineer and my mother was a custom jeweler. And at a club in Washington, D.C. called The Bayou, I did front of house for such bands as Foreigner, Dire Straits, Pat Benatar, etc. I was the front of house for many showcase bands attempting to get signed. In June of 1985, I was offered API at a very low price because the current owners wanted to trim the assets to sell the whole company, particularly the audio part of the company. I purchased the company and opened it in a 20 by 30 foot office and received a phone call from a guy named Shelly Yakis looking for API 560 equalizers. Shelly was my first customer and has remained a good friend since. We were a company that grew without any kind of credit line as we were self-funded. Later, I sold API and in 2005, I started Tone Lux. And then in 2012, started Fix Audio Designs. LLC to make consoles again. The current product line includes a stereo input module, a 5.1 input module, and an immersive input module with object sends. I'm currently the only company in the world making analog immersive consoles. The console can be fitted with any op amp transformer combination to get any console tone you desire. The stereo input module allows you to choose three different tones, and each of the three mix buses can have any op amp transformer. 
The stereo module also has a DAW monitor loop, much like an inline console. I've also designed products like the Tony Shepard A Designs Mix Factory, the Sunset Sound 2D Mic Pre, a Lindell input module with EQ and a compressor, analog alien EPI universal pedal interface, the Slate VMS1 Mic Pre, the Slate control monitor system, the new Slate audio monitor system, and was involved in the new Slate audio VSX headphone system. So I'm really excited to have you here, Paul. Thanks so much for joining us. Please welcome Paul Wolf to Recording Studio Rockstars. Paul, are you ready to rock, dude? <laughs> You're not going to believe what I did about a month ago. When I, you know, you guys, a lot of people have my doubler flanger plug-in that I did with uh, SoftTube. Yeah. And the doubler is just, it's the best. I mean, it's its an amazing doubler. Um, you know, my flanger doubler, the original prototype, the analog prototype um, I had in the club at the Bayou nightclub. And um, I, I've been looking for it for years. Um, and I found the guy who, who ended up with it and I bought it back from him. So this was a, you made a physical flanger and a doubler yeah, back I'll, in the seventies, right? I'll show you. This is, uh, this is the original. Wow. <laughs> Letra set labels, um, bucket brigade delays. Oh, I love um, the, love the knobs on that thing too. Yeah. I don't even remember where I got those knobs. It was some, you know, some, something, but this was in the seventies. So, you know, I probably was at Canal Street, New York. <laughs> right on. Well, I guess, uh, how would you describe it? Cause of course our podcast listeners won't be able to see that. Those well, it was a, right? it was a two U box. There was a guy named John Roberts, who is the guy who has that DIY um, blog near it at um, PV for a long time really smart guy. Um, I learned a lot about manufacturing from him because he was like, he was like rabid about minimizing the number of parts he had in stock. So if he needed a, a you know, hundred microfarad cap and he'd occasionally needed a 200, he would put two hundreds together so he could buy more hundreds and get the price down, you know, but he had a company called loft. And if you remember, right, they made an oscillator and stuff like that. And they had these kits you could buy that had delays and you could, you could make your own delay thing. So I bought the kit and the noise reduction and started playing around with the delays. And I figured out a way to cancel the flanging tone of the, the doubling when you got below 15 milliseconds. And to this day, nobody has figured it out. It's, it's amazing, but nobody has figured it out. Why is that important? Why would you, why do you need to cancel the flanging tone? Below well, because if you get it, you know, most doubling, you can hear it, you know, it goes, bit it, bit it like that. Right. And my goal was to get it so close that it just sounded like a fatter voice. It didn't sound like it was even being doubled, you know, and yeah. if this thing is so good. The plugin is, is so dead on. These guys at SoftTube did a great job. So yeah, so what I found was if you get if you can get into that range below 15 milliseconds, then it just so, starts to sound like it's a fatter instrument. And you can get it down to 3 milliseconds, which with flanging would be like you know, it would be like right at the point where it crosses over, you know. Yeah. And there's none of that. And you can put it on a nylon string guitar and strum it and it the guitar just rotates and you don't hear any pick double picking or anything, you know? So I did this in the analog world and it was, it was amazing. And every year at, at the AES show, I'd go around to everybody's, you know, delay booths when they were doing their stuff and, and I'd listen to their doublers and nobody, no, nobody, the chorus things, they would be like chorusy or they'd be reverby or they'd be roomy or this something, but nobody had it down to where it sounded like someone really double tracking their vocal. And mine actually sounds like, it, it sounds a lot like the, the, you know, the, the fast tape thing, the 60 IPS tape thing that they, you know, the Abbey Road stuff that they did when they were running, when they would run a tape machine really fast and just the, the flutter of it would cause this, the uh, pitch variation. Yeah. It has that kind of a hissy sort of weird effect. And I've, I've had people send me vocals and I send them back doubled and they go, how did you do that? It sounds like she's saying it twice, you know? That's awesome. So I remember hearing stories about John Lennon hating 
to double his vocals because it was sort of um, tedious in the studio. And so that's where they came up with the automatic double tracking, right? Did you ever get a chance to uh, have him or anybody else use your um, your your doubler or anybody? No, the doubler, really the, the second doubler I made, which I actually have, um, I sent up to Mike DeLug in New York when he worked at Media Sound. And he used it on en- Engelbert Humperdinck's records, who the guy, you know, the guy was a really good singer. The parallel between him and Lennon is that they um, they were good singers, but they sang they sang from their heart. So they couldn't sing it again the same way. So if you wanted to double the vocal, you had to do like each line over and over and over. You had to learn. It was almost like ADR. You had to learn the line over where a lot of singers can sing right on top of themselves and it's dead on because they're singing a part that they worked out in their head. And he was the same way. He could not double his voice because he was always, he had so many vibrato things and stuff. So using the doubler on it, it was amazing. The other thing that was kind of cool was he used it on Copacabana on the uh, horns. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the horns weren't big enough. And it was like the horns left. They were gone, you know, and you got, well, I'll just call them up and spend another 10 grand, you know. <laughs> so they use the double around the horns on Copacabana, and it sounds like a bigger horn section. Too bad you couldn't have gotten that to Phil Spector back in the day. A wall of sound would have been so much easier, right? Yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't have had to beat up the musicians so much. <laughs> but I mean, this is, you know, that, that so that was my goal is to get it in that in that red zone where you can't do it with a regular delay because it just flanges. So... I was able to figure out a way to do that. And so now I'm actually working with Analog Alien and it's going to be that same pedal. That That's going to be a very cool box when it comes out. So it'll so be this the, is going to be this is going to be like a guitar style pedal, but it's the yeah. doubler effect. So you could yeah. use it as a guitar rig or use it in the studio on a, um, you know, on a track. Well, their EPI is very cool because that product um, has... It has XLR in, quarter inch in, and RCA in. So it does guitar level, line, you know, plus four, and it does minus 10 all at once. And it comes out guitar level, plus four, and minus 10. And so you can go in guitar level, come out plus four, and then you can go in plus four and come out guitar level. So you can do reamping with it. And it's the 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 value of that particular box is it's absolutely calibrated. So if you go in with your guitar level at plus four and you play it back at plus four, it comes out exactly the same as your guitar level was. So when you reamp it, you're a lot closer to where you were. Now, obviously, you have the the low impedance output versus the guitar output, which makes a difference. But then it also has two insert jacks on the side, and you can you can insert one or the other or both. So you can have, if you want to do live flanging, you can do two delay units. They're very cool. Fascinating. No matter where you like to rock in the galaxy, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron lets you record up to two terabytes over USB-C with speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second, transfer your tracks in a flash, and take your samples and sessions with you to the studio or stage. The OWC Envoy Pro Electron is your waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof SSD that you can rely on. Use our custom link in the show notes to help support this podcast at maxsales.com slash rockstars. If you've ever wondered how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars, it's because I've been cheating by using Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron on every single episode. Right now, you're hearing on my voice RX breath control, D-click, D-clip, D-S, D-plosive, voice denoise, Ozone multiband compression, Neutron EQ, and Limited, all from Isotope. Check out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. I was trying to follow that. Are you saying that there's um, like high-level and low-level inputs and outputs on it? So you could go guitar in, guitar out, or you could yep. go XLR in and XLR out? 
Yeah, it has it has a guitar in and a guitar through, and then it has the guitar buffered out, which is the same level, and the plus four out and a minus ten out. So you can use you can plug it into an iPhone. You can plug an iPhone into it. It's a bump box, but it's designed for live or the studio. Um, but it has two insert points, so you can come in wow. plus four, drop it down to a pedal level go into the pedal and then bring it back up to plus four into the, into your DAW if you want, which a pedal, interesting thing about pedals is they sound completely different when you plug something buffered into them, than you plug a guitar into them. Totally, totally. And a huge, so you can try even just arranging your pedals on a pedal board in different combinations can have different sounds. And that's one of the values of this is that, that it has a very cool effect that, um, you can, you know, you can put it on something and it'll sound different because it's buffered. So you can literally go, you can go into it with a guitar, come out, buff it unbuffered. So it's a parallel out that you can go into an amp and you can come out of the two, out of the, the, the insert jacks. You can go those into a, uh, into two more guitar amps and then come out of the buffered output into a fourth guitar amp. So you can use this thing as a distribution amp for guitars too. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, well, so, it's pretty cool. You know, cool. I've done I've done some you know knocking signals down to pedals, <laughs> and sometimes it's harder than you th- think it's going to be. You know, and I've also noticed sometimes you knock something down to guitar level, and some of the interfaces might be noisier than others, and actually introduce a bunch of noise and and um, you know maybe impedance issues and things like that. So what the one you're talking about is the analog alien EPI, is that right? Yeah, EPI. That's called the effects pedal interface. Okay, and cool. I like it. It's um it's cool because it it uses it uses um you know op amps, but I they're ultra quiet op amps. And there is no when you drop this a plus four down to a guitar level, you don't hear any noise. That's and great. you take a guitar and you bump it up, you don't hear any noise. I mean it's it's a silent box. It's, I mean, those guys said, you know, look, if we're going to do this, it can't, it can't make noise. I mean, it has to be like, it's not there, but it's there because it's converting, you know? So it's a nice box for that. I mean, you can use that as a pedal interface for your DAW and it sounds amazing. Go into your amp and then have it as a direct box. It's got a ground lift on it and it's got an output pad. So you can send it line level out or you can pad the, the balanced output so it's mic level. Okay, so, so it doesn't necessarily have an XLR out. Yeah, it has an XLR it does in and out. Also, in and yeah, out. it does okay. have an XLR in and out, quarter inch in and out, and RCA in and out. Oh, I'm seeing now. I'm seeing the the. I'm looking at it now online. It looks cool. Oh yeah, it's nice a nice box. box. Yeah, it nice is. Box. It's really nice. It's uh, it's really really well done. So Sweet. that you know, that's one of the things that that I did, and we're doing. They're a, they're really good guys. They're, we're going to do a the delay pedal is going to be the same box. And then we're going to probably do, we're thinking about doing a mic preversion where you um, you take the uh, a microphone, it'll be like the EPI, but it'll have a mic pre in it. So if you're a, if you're a live singer, you can have your mic go into it, has two insert points, and then it has the PA output, which is line or mic. And then it, and you adjust the mic gain just for a range. You know, right. So no basically, like, if you want to sing using cool effects on stage, you have you'll have more control over that. You can yeah, because so many people use pedals because pedals are a very inexpensive way to get a lot of cool effects. But pedals are always screwy. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, there, there's only a handful of pedals that have line and mic switches on them. You know, or, or guitar instrument. Um, so what they generally do is they generally mark the the they set the gain so it's like almost distorting with a keyboard and almost too noisy for a guitar. So they find that point where they work for both. And that way they don't have to put a switch on them. And then you have a couple of companies that, that have instrument guitar or they have instrument keyboard. And that just does, it does one of these things with the, you know, it optimizes the noise. Well, so, and it, <clears throat> it, as far as what I feel like I've seen when somebody's trying to get cool effects on a voice, they typically just end up buying some kind of, digital microphone XLR input box that has built-in effects. Um, And there might be some other options out there to use your pedals, but I like that idea that you're talking about where you can, you know, go into a, go into something, get a cool vocal sound using whatever pedals you want and blend it in and keep your vocal 
Love a lot that. of those, and a lot of those pedals have like uh, MIDI interfaces. Yeah. So you can go and you can have a whole bunch of presets, you know, and the, yeah. the fact that you're bumping the level down to their level and then bumping it back up again work. You send those two feeds to front of house and that's it. You're done, you know? Well, so Paul, uh, I love that we just jump right into talking about some cool gear stuff, but <laughs> let me, let me rewind just a little bit. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your, your interest in getting into the, the tech side of audio in the first place. Did you start out playing lots of music yourself, you know, with an instrument and then sort of find that you were good at soldering and wiring stuff? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I was, I was in a, you know, a crappy band. Um, Those are my favorite kind. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was called the odd five. Nice. <laughs> and you know we tried you know i my the thing is i i noticed early on i mean my brother became a really good guitar player he's actually a really good he plays stand-up bass now and he's really really good um i just never i never committed myself to it i, I you know i liked guitar i liked drums a lot better i you know i the, i have the drum kit sitting next to me i i helped uh slate do the uh the mimic pro drum machine clean that up and and you know so i have a i have a kit here i'm a much better drummer than i am a guitar player but i can play guitar and bass and drums well enough to get a good sound which i thought okay you know I, let me have his recorder he had a tape recorder and i started playing with that and i really enjoyed that part of it so i started looking more towards the technical side of it because i was into electronics at a young age i mean i um i actually we went to we did the um the the, the uh, national lampoon vacation was to the t in a station wagon going to disneyland um at the same period of time and went through the tp hotel the big ball of yarn all the stuff that he saw um got there 3 days after walt disney died and my dad actually jacked up the bumper car operator against the wall and said you're going to open this ride or i'm going to break your neck because we drove i didn't drive two effing weeks to get here and have this thing closed and he goes no problem i mean it was just like national Lampers. wally's world wally's world yeah i mean that's exactly what it was that's hilarious. and we had the same station wagon except it didn't have all the lights in the front and we didn't have the grandmother or the dog but uh it was that it was exactly the same thing you know but then we went up to um, Anderson's split, split Pea Soup, which I ended up moving to that same city. Then we went up to uh, San Francisco, I think. Or no, Santa Barbara. We went down to Santa Barbara. Yeah, well, that's right, because we went up from Disneyland up to Santa Barbara, visited my aunt and her and her husband. And, of course, I was like, doing, 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 you know. So they put me in the garage, and he was an electronics guy. So he had this bench with all these parts on it. And I built my first mic preamp. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia, featuring the patented golden drop capsule design for enhanced clarity that will give your recordings that classic vintage tone. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z V12 mic. Our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to Recording Studio Rockstar's listeners, so use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR to get 40% off the V67, V47, and V12 microphones. Go to jzmic.com and get your vintage mic now. Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound weak and distant or lack punch and clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding like professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you're in Logic, Cubase, PreSona, Studio One, Reaper, or whatever you're using. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode.
so running with the uh, family vacation at the point at which that kid was stirring the Kool-Aid after he like, you know, with his arm yeah. or it was the, you know, that's where you were in the, in the shop learning the electronics. Yeah. That's basically, that's basically it. I mean, it was, uh, it was actually, it was very cool. I mean, it, uh, I, I remember it was a, a, a two N one Oh seven transistor, which was, I, I think it might've been, been germanium, but he had a microphone and he had a speaker and he had this stuff. And I opened these books and I was looking at all the, the stuff and I, I built it up and I talked in the mic and it came out of the speaker and I was like, Oh my God, you know? And I ran inside and I was ah, like that. And that was kind of the beginning of my interest. And then yeah. I was in high school and I started taking electronics at night at the college and the high school hated it because they thought that I was, um, like I should be concentrating algebra in high school. I was getting D's in and exactly the same algebra in college. I was getting A's in. And it was because the college had a, um, it was the application of the formula where high school was just learning the formula. So, you know, the old, I, I tell the story a million times, the flagpole height and the flagpole shadow and then a the hypotenuse in electronics, that's, you know, reactance, resi reactance, resistance, and impedance. So, you know, I was getting A's in electronics math. And the books, the, the interesting thing were the books were like this. Day by day, the, the, the class stuff was exactly the same. And it just showed how sh shitty of an attitude I had toward high school. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't quite finish... Um, I got an associate's degree in electronics. I left four weeks early because I went on the road with a band. And the guy that my teacher said, you know what? If you're going on the road doing electronics and sound and stuff, then I'm going to pass you in the course because that's the whole point. Nice. So he did. So I never got a full associate's degree because I, I bagged out of English and all the other stuff. But the electronics thing, I got the certificate. And that was it. I got a I got my FCC license when I was 15. What's the FCC license? The FCC was the uh you know the uh Federal Communications Commission. You had to get a you had to go down and take a test. Um and it was I had you had a third class, second class and first class. First class were engineers, second class were like assistants and and third class you had to be a third class to be able to broadcast. Okay, because cool. So this would some, be like if you wanted to get into radio or anything, you'd have radio to and television. Yeah, you had to have a third class because if something went wrong with the transmitter, you had to have basic knowledge of operations, and you had to have you had to understand the laws, and you had to understand the procedures. Or second class got into more of the electronics, but not the deep stuff. Like you could uh, adjust things and things like that. And then first class was basically fixing transmitters and antennas and understanding wavelengths and all that shit. So I got that. Uh, me and another kid were the two youngest um, kids, I think, in the country that got those. Um, we got, uh, he was 14 and I was 15. Nice. He ended up being the CEO of some semiconductor company. It feels familiar to me. I mean, when I was a teenager, I got a projectionist license for the movie theater that my family ran. And that was kind of my introduction to the tech side of things. And even even the music that we would play between movies, we had a reel to reel, and I had to thread up a reel of T for the Tillerman, Cat Stevens, and like, you know, wind the wind the tape and press play, so that we had in between music. Yeah, I mean that's the that was there were procedures, you know, before you had to just hit a button. I mean, in in a radio station, you used to have to take transmitter readings every twenty minutes. You just know? to make sure you weren't over transmitting because you didn't want to steal everybody's bandwidth, right? Yeah. And if you did, you got in a lot of trouble. I, I had a bootleg radio station when I was a kid, and I had one of my friends at the radio station call me up and he said, Hey, I heard the FCC's in town with a truck trying to find you. So you might want to cool it. <laughs> and I looked out my window and I saw a van that actually had the round <laughs> antenna. And they were they were going like this. And I saw that and I just shut it off immediately. And then they kept going like this. And then they drove down a little ways and I turned it back on and they turned <laughs> around and I turned it off. I had some fun with them, but they never, awesome. they never figured it out. But it. yeah, I mean, they, they were, you know, it was interesting. They were, they had a good budget. Um, and they, that you would, they, they required you to have a license and then they charged you like $40. And back in the sixties and seventies, that was a lot of money to get the license. Mm -hmm. And some guy sued them and said that you can't 
make pass a law that says you have to have a license. And then the same organization charges you one. It actually went to the Supreme Court. And so basically what happened is the FCC lost their funding because that's how they funded themselves. Wow. So that's well, when you, you know got, me, I like a good underdog story. So well, yeah. So what so what happened was you used to have to renew your license every five years and you used to have to go in and take a test. Well, the last time I got the license, it said lifetime. And that's how they eliminated that. So they were basically, you know, floating around doing not doing a lot until cell phones came along and they figured out they could sell airspace. Yeah, totally. And that's when they started screwing all the live guys because they started grabbing all the the frequency slots because the, you know, the audio people, they, they would find bands that were really clear and really good and they would make wireless phones. And then the FCC would say, Oh, we're taking those. And uh, you know, that's going to be T-Mobile now, you know? And so that's why they kept on. Those guys have been pushed around so many times. It's just unbelievable. I love it. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's where that ended up. So I, you know, I ended up on the road with a band and uh, traveled, you know, traveled, pretty much east of the Mississippi in just about every state and every city and every club that existed be- between two different bands. And, what years uh, of your life were you on the road doing the travel thing? Was it like teens or early 20s? Well, let's see. It was day three I graduated, so I was 18 then, 18 and 19. So it was probably 2004 I went on the road. or I mean, uh, 74 or 75 I went on the road. Um, and then um, traveling on the road is when I ended up at the Bayou. So 1976 through 79, I believe I was at the Bayou. I don't even remember but the exact dates, but it was right at the time when Foreigner was coming out and Pat Benatar and, and you know, The Clash and Kiss and all those bands were just starting to come about. And that was in Washington, D.C.? That was in D.C. So I, I ended up I went out with one band and traveled around for a while and then left them, um, stayed at a nightclub in Niles, Michigan called Shula's, which was actually very cool because they were, that club was, we were 30 minutes from Electric Voice and 20 minutes from Crown. Wow. So those guys would bring stuff over for us to play with. So we had one of those Suncraft consoles in the metal case, the 1604s which is, I still actually have one of those original ones. I bought one on eBay just to have it. So I had one of those, and we had the TL cabinets that Electro Voice made in those white horns. And I was probably the only person in the country that knew uh, a high-pass shelf going into those horns because they were constant directivity. So the high end seemed to diminish. So if you brought it up like that, they worked really nice and they were great sounding horns and then crown amplifiers. And so we had a nice PA system in this club and I met a band and I really liked the band. And so I went on the road with them and they were from DC. Right. So, and were you, uh, were you there doing that in 67 or was it later than that? That was, that would be in the seventies. So okay. you just um, missed yeah. me being born in DC. then. Adam Audio introduces the new A7V monitor for home and pro studios, the next generation of the incredibly popular A7X. The all new A series line of monitors delivers the same highly accurate transparent sound and unique accelerated ribbon tweeter design that has made Adam Audio famous for over a decade, but now introduces new innovations such as the rotatable high frequency propagation system waveguide, allowing the the XART tweeter to disperse sound with controlled consistency and DSP based room correction and speaker voicings. Using the A control software or SonarWorks in a measurement mic, you can now integrate advanced filters directly onto the DSP on board the speaker to help compensate for imperfect room acoustics without introducing annoying latency or requiring plugins. This allows you to tune your monitors for your room, your mix position and your ears anytime you want to meet your ever-evolving studio needs. Get the extended five-year warranty for monitors that will improve as your studio improves at adamaudio.com. 
For 15 years, I recorded hundreds of bands like Jack White, Adele, and the Black Keys in my hay bale studio at the Bonnaroo Festival. I had to work fast and deliver finished mixes to the radio DJs within an hour, so I chose to use the Solid State Logic AWS 948 Plus for my mixing console. There's just no substitute for mixing on a real console. Until now, that is. SSL brings you the UF8 and UC1 controllers so that you can re recreate the feel and speed of mixing on a console with the flexibility of mixing on your computer in your home studio. Paired with the SSL Channel Strip 2 and 4000B plugins, you can now get a world-class sound using real faders and real knobs to mix as fast as your ears will guide you. Levels, panning, EQ, and compression, they're all built right into the controllers. So go put the feeling back into your mixes at solidstatelogic.com. Hey, rock stars! we're back now for the second half of this show, a.k.a. the Jam Session. My guest today is Paul Wolf joining us from, where are you joining us from, Paul? Nashville. Nashville, just kind of south of me, right? You're sort of yeah. a little, I'm little in, south of I'm in city. Spring Hill, yeah. Yeah, that's a cool spot. I've been down there. Um, and uh, you ready to jam, rock, second half it? Whatever. Yeah, let's do that, second half it. We're, <laughs> we were... Uh, we were getting a job at the Bayou nightclub as a front of house guy. And that's where yeah. I left off. I mean, that, well, you know what? Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say, let me, let me drop in a couple of quick questions and then we'll keep going from there. All right. We got some questions in our Facebook group from the rock stars and uh, rock stars. If you want to be able to participate in the podcast and, and put your questions in, come join our Facebook group at recording studio, rock stars, Facebook groups, whatever the links in the, in the show notes so you can check it out let's see here we got one from eric lee and eric, eric said um is the 2d mic pre discontinued can't find it on the website what's that all about it's like a modded 312 or what uh the 2d mic pre is a um replication of the original sunset sound mic pre's that are in the studio one console and the studio three consoles and it is a dual 990. It's got a large input transformer, Cinemag input transformer, uh, the large one, the, the two to one transformer. And then it's got the um, high nickel um, output transformer. And it does the gain each each stage. It does six on the input, six on the output, six on the input, six on the output, six on the input, six on the output. That's how it does it. So each you know input stage, it. it does goes like this as you turn the gain switch up. Uh, we've been having real problems getting nine ninety, so we're probably going to have to start building our own. That's been the big the big hassle. So and a nine ninety is is an op amp. Yeah, it's an op amp. Yes, yeah, it's the, okay. it's the uh, you know. So um, that's that's one of the big problems is is getting those op amps. The guys. Now, you know, if I recall, like, I remember reading some something about how um, when you had API. That was one of your things was to take that op amp design and figure out how to manufacture it efficiently and all that. So that is there anything you want to talk about um, the creation of op amps and and how that has evolved? Yeah, you know, the 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 problem, you know, the problem with op amps, and this goes back to the whole debate about through hole versus surface mount. Um, like surface mount resistors and capacitors are are spectacular. They're the same, you know, because they just basically took the legs off. Transistors can be a little different. Um, small signal ones, not so much because they have very small dyes. You know, the dyes are like little pieces of dust and they bond wire to them and then hook them to the leads. So the, the normal transistor that you see, the little, what they call it, TO92, which has got, you know, the three leads coming out of the bottom. It's got a little black cap on it. That die is the same die that's in a surface mount transistor, which is just a little square thing with a couple of leads coming out of it. They're, they're pretty much identical. Uh, when you get into the larger stuff, though, they start becoming a little different because the larger size have bigger dies, so they can do more current. And because they have bigger dies, they have higher capacitance between the junctions. And so what happens is a lot of times the input stage and the output stage aren't the same speed. And if the output stage is slower, you can have a high frequency oscillation within the amplifier that you never see on the output. You never hear it. You never see it, even with test equipment. And so what happens a lot of times is if you, you know, when you select the output, have your amp compensated correctly internally, 
the the op the op amp can oscillate and you don't really hear it except it just seems like it doesn't have the headroom that it should and that's the sign of it oscillating and they can oscillate two megahertz you don't you know you won't hear it they'll never make it through the output amps so you can't compensate it you can't control it you don't even know it's happening but it just sounds bad it's happening internally in other words it's happening because there's stages you have the input stage which is your gain stage then you have a intermediate stage you may have another gain stage depending on if you want a lot of gain and then you have a an intermediate stage that basically drives the output stage and those those three stages two to three stages are always small signal devices and they're always the same speed but then you get into the larger output devices if you want to drive a transformer or something like that now you get into a larger die, they're a lot slower, and you've got to be careful. So you've got to compensate those input stages so they all match. And this has to do with like if you took a if you basically took a um a parametric EQ and you put it on the output of the first stage and you rolled it off at, you know, let's say two megahertz, 60 B per octave. And now the next stage pulls off at exactly the same point. And then the next stage, exactly the same point. Or later, but never earlier. And then the final stage, the same thing. Well, the problem is the final stage determines your bandwidth. So you have to go back and compensate those earlier stages so they roll off before or equal to the output stage. And it's tough to get that balanced right because that all changes as the gain goes up and down, the impedances inside these op amps change. So it's it's really tough to do that and make a stable op amp. That's pretty intense. Yeah, and I took that on when I when I had Tone Lux, I decided, you know, the 2520 was a good op amp. It was a high gain op amp, wasn't really fast, um, but it was it was a nice, you know, it had a nice sound to it, mid, nice clear mid-range, you know. Um, the transformer was matched to it basically, and they together they sounded really nice. The same with Rupert stuff. Rupert matched his op amp, which is a pretty generic amplifier, but he was Rupert's expertise was transformers, and he made a transformer that passed that nice sound through. Because if you wanted to do balanced stuff, you had to have a transformer because everything had a transformer, and you had to you had to drive, you know, three hundred to six hundred ohm compressors. They have a load switch. You can do 600 or 10K. Same with the input, 600 or 10K. And a lot of older stuff like the 175s, you have to put a termination resistor on the output because the transformer goes crazy if it doesn't see that load. Yeah. So, you know, so you have to, if you're driving, um, you know, if, you're, if you've got a 600 ohm load and you have a, you're driving a transformer and the transformer has a one to two ratio, then that 600 ohms is now 300 ohms. To the it's what it reflects to the op amp, and that so that op amp has to be able to drive 300 ohms. Now, if you're driving something lower than that, then if it's a two to one or a three to one ratio, you ratio it backwards, and that's your that's what you have to drive. So, if you're driving a three to one transformer into 600 ohms, it's 150 ohms on the primary, and you're getting down to the point where you're getting into the power amp range, and you've got to be able to drive some serious stuff with that. Same with tubes, although the ratios are reversed, they have to be able to drive 600 ohms. So their their ratio, their output transformers, was one of the reasons they were so big was because they had to go from like a 4K to 10K impedance down to a you know an 8 ohm impedance or a 600 ohm impedance. So that's you know that's why that that ratio is so big. Well, that's pretty intense stuff. We we might be getting a little bit outside of our our purview here. Well, but the, uh... there is one there one one important thing. Everybody knows that you're not supposed to unplug a guitar amp speaker while the guitar amp is running. Right, it's bad. And a lot of what amp about in are... standby? Can you put the guitar amp? Standby, standby is fine, but when you're running when you're running signal in there, okay. The problem is that when you unplug it, all of a sudden that load goes away. Yeah, and it's just like a spark coil in a car. Okay. When you when you when the points close in the old you know the coil the points mm -hmm. close when they open, okay that that drop in magnetic field was picked up by that that bigger coil and that put out the ten thousand volt spark that sparked the spark plug. What happens when you pull that load out? The same thing happens in the tube amp, 
But now you're going from eight ohms to 10K, which that ratio is so high that it can arc the tube socket. And and that's what burns out the output that's, is. That's what burns, the, the, burns the, the thing. And then what happens when you arc it, it has a little carbon path and it just, it stays arced. That, hap- that used to be a big thing with trainer amplifiers. Hey man, that's what they trained me to do with carbon arc projectors. In, in that's movies. exactly <laughs> what, you, you short them out and then you open them up. And that's you what- You open them up and then you get this crazy arc and then you have to keep the timer going so you burn yeah, it Yeah, and, and they, they feed right. in slowly. That whole impedance ratio thing is really important. So nowadays you don't have that. So transformers aren't as necessary, although they add to the sound. I wanted to ask you, I remember reading that Abbey Road had sort of impedance matched the inputs and outputs of all their gear. I forgot what it was, 600 or 200 or something. 600 ohms, yeah, most yeah, 600. What, so is that related and, and how important is that kind of thing? Does that really happen? Well, the, the thing is, is a lot, of the, a lot of those tube amplifiers and stuff like that, they, the transformers, because the transformers just, they're two coils and the... If you don't have anything holding them down, they can they bounce around and they have resonances and they have peaks and they have all kinds of shit. You put a resistor across it, now it's going into a load and everything kind of settles down. So all those things, you know, the guitar amps, the tube amps, the old compressors, all that kind of stuff, um, they all had a sound based on the load. And if you took the load off, they sounded completely different. And sometimes they sounded really bad. The load on it, they would be right. But then... So then if you have a 600 ohm load on the output of something, you don't want to have a load on the input because then you're doubling the load. So that output load loads the input, but some inputs had to have 600 ohms on them too. So like uh, like the Sunset Sound Studio One console, the thing that I bought when they put the big console and I bought their old one, which is the one that T-Bone just sold on Reverb for oh, wow. half a million bucks, <laughs> um, <laughs> if I would have known. Um, they actually on the patch bay they had output and output mult and if you switch the output it would bypass the load resistor and if you switched output mult the load resistor was still there and that's what they had to do on patch bays that's why a lot of patch bays had double rows for outputs because if you were patching from a compressor output to a equalizer input and they both had 600 ohm loads You'd lose level and they would sound weird. So you'd have, when you patch them, it would disconnect the load on one of them. Wow. We have, yeah. we had no idea how easy we have it today. Oh yeah. yeah. It, it's, you know, now it's like low impedance out, high impedance in, whatever, you know, yeah. but this is one of the reasons why microphones, when you click the pad in, the microphone sounds completely different because the microphone primary, the transformer you know, microphone output are typically 150 ohms. That's there. There's 50 and there's 200 and stuff, but most of them are 150. The input impedance of a transformer is 1500. Okay, and then the secondary of that transformer usually has a load on it, and that load is so that whole chain looks like 1500 ohms. So when the mic looks at it, it's loaded correctly. And the rule, the reason. That's what they call the, the, you know, that's what they call the word that explains why things are. The reason <laughs> is because they have to be, to, they call them bridging transformers. And a bridging transformer is a transformer that has, if you have a 600 ohm source, which is your output of your EQ, the input impedance would be 6K. And that means it's 10 times whatever that is, and you lose less than a dB. That's what a bridging transformer is. And that's what a mic transformer is. A mic transformer is a bridging transformer that bridges the microphone with 10 times the impedance so the mic doesn't get loaded. Okay. By the next item. Yeah, by the next item, which is the transformer. But because there are two coils, they they interact because when you you know, put a pulse into a coil, into the other coil, and that coil goes like this. And those kind of things interact. And the microphone has a sound because of that. Yeah. Most microphones in those days were designed to look into a transformer. So they were, they sounded different if you put them into a transformer or into a solid state input. So you had to have that. Now the, the problem comes in when you put a pad in there, the pad is designed, and the, the interesting thing is the only pad that actually works that's a simple pad is 20 dB because you got to load the mic 
with 1500 ohms and you got to load the transformer with 150 ohms. So when you switch that pad in, that pad has to, the pad on this side has to equal 1500. The pad on this side has to equal 150. So the math is that this resistor plus this resistor plus this resistor on the primary side is is 1500 ohms, but the secondary side only sees one of those resistors, which is 150 ohms. So what happens is it pads it down 20 dB, but it also disconnects that connection between the two coils. So the, the microphone seems to have settled down a little bit. And so when you click it in, the sound that you had is not going to be the sound that you got now. So that's why a lot of people separate those two interactions. It's almost like it's like putting a, you know, somebody that plays with their fingers and giving them a pick. It's a completely different connection to the guitar. You yeah, know? exactly. And, and I, I remember noticing that when I was in the studio, you know, putting a pad on a mic because a vocal was too loud or something. And then I realized I was like, wait, this doesn't sound as good anymore. It right. doesn't sound the same. And I know in some situations it can be done really well, and in others not so well. And well, so that it depends it, on the mic. Now, if you're yeah. if you're using a a, a FET mic, it's not going to be as big of a problem because the FET mic is got an active circuit driving the transformer. But if you use a dynamic mic, then you don't have anything, you know, on that side. It's the coil v- feeding a transformer, feeding another transformer. Yeah, and I guess take takeaway rock stars is. Use your ears. Make sure you're listening as you try. These yeah, because it things. will change. And now what I did to alleviate that when I, because the thing about mic preamps is that most mic preamps with the gain all the way down, aside from the gain in the transformers, because they always have some gain, there's always 6 dB of gain in the amplifier. So you get to a point like with a kick drum where it's just clipping and you turn it down all the way and it goes, doesn't go down low enough and it's just clipping and you got to go, oh my God, I got to put the pad in, you know, and it's going to change. So what I did with the Tone Lux stuff, brought the gain down to zero, it actually put that amplifier into unity. So you could actually turn that amp, that mic pre down 60 B lower than anybody else's and you could get right under that peak. And so if you turn the gain down all the way, you were just barely hit that peak and you didn't have to use a pad that's and it worked for a kick and snare. And that's the only reason I did it, you know, it's to be able to not have the pad. Well, I love hearing stories about gear being designed like that, where you know exactly what the use case is and you know what the real situation is like in the studio and you're dealing with a kick and a snare and you got to get that level down, you know, and you, but you want it to well, sound great. That's traditionally, that's why all the old stuff sounds the way it does is because everything was built for a reason. And there were rules that you had to follow. And the rules, you know, nobody likes to follow rules, but some of those rules are basically mean um, that you have to, if you want it to sound like we say it sounds, you have to do this. So that's an important rule to follow. As far as turning everything up all the way, you can do whatever you want. But it's like a pull tech, you know. Uh, when Steve Jackson bought Pultec, you know, one of the things that we we discussed when he was buying it is that I said, you know, one of the things you're going to run into is you are spending so much time making these things exactly like they were originally. They're not going to sound like the new, the ones new. They're going to sound like they did when they were new. And that's a, that's a critical thing because everybody's going to say, well, they don't sound like the, a Pultec. Well, everybody's trying to make a Pultec sound like a current Pultec. Now, in 50 years, those pull techs are going to sound probably really bad because they're going to deteriorate the same way that these did. So he right, got in yeah. front of it, you know, he got in front of it and said, well, the difference between, you know, this is sounds like they did when they were new. Now it becomes a thing and it's cool, you know. But in those days, there were reasons. I mean, you know, the the why do they why does a pull tech cut narrow and boost wide, you know? Well, the original, uh, the original ones, you know, they needed to cut out hum, but they needed to boost the low end. So, you know, that's why they cut out, you know, a certain frequency or the high end. They needed to get rid of sibilance, but they wanted to boost the highs. So they always were like that, you know. Yeah, which makes them really useful. Yeah, it does. Now we use them for for a different reason. I mean, with the low frequency, you can get two bumps out of it by boosting and cutting at the same time, but. You know, there was always a specific reason. And the reason there are so many different models is because, you know, a broadcaster said, I need to cut out hum and increase presence. And then some guy said, you know, we really have a mid-range problem. Can you add a mid-control? We only need it to boost. 
you know, and then the guy says, well, I got, I need it to cut. This is what happens, you know, is you end up with those types of things. Nowadays, one of the problems with the stuff that people are make is they're trying to make it cool, but they don't really know why. Right. You know, and well, that's probably just make sales. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just to, because that's what people want. They think they want that, you know, it's yeah, fe yeah. feature creep. <laughs> There's a lot of junk that needs to get cleaned up in a podcast or music mix. Boomy pops on the microphones, piercing sibilance, background noise, harshness, distortion, wild dynamics, and EQ correction. And all this editing and mixing cleanup would be impossibly time consuming were it not for the magic of Isotope RX, Ozone, and Neutron. Isotope gives you a collection of plugins for mixing in your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with set it and forget it simplicity. Check out the new Repair Assistant plugin to help you find the perfect mix prep settings for any instrument. And the standalone RX app includes new features like text transcription and multiple speaker recognition for easy editing and navigation. Try out the subscription app with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. The OWC Envoy Pro Electron is your super fast and rugged pocket-sized portable USB-C SSD that keeps your music safe in the studio or on the stage. With storage of up to two terabytes and speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron gives you high-speed audio data for recording and playback. Take your sessions and sample libraries with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof, so there's no need to worry about your music anymore. Find the new Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. And use the custom link below in our show notes because it's a great way for you to help support this podcast. So thanks, Rockstars. Um, all right, let's see. We got we got a few more questions. I don't know if these ones are quite as uh, detailed. Alex Oana, of course, says, Paul, tell us about your inner dialogue. <laughs> I told him it was my... Uh, you said uh, my swing filet? Swing filet instead of feng shui. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, my my inner dialogue, um, I, learned, I learned my inner dialogue when I left API. One of the things that I learned when I sold the company was that I had to maintain the API genre. If it didn't sound like API, people were like, why, why doesn't this sound like a 550A, you know? Rupert Neve had the same problem, you know, that and that's one of the things that Josh Thomas always said is everybody used to ask Rupert, does it sound like a 1073? And the question is, have you ever heard a 1073? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. But that seems like the question to ask. So, you know, I... When I started Tone Lux, I thought, I'm not going to listen to anything anybody wants me to do. So I designed an op amp. It was low gain instead of high gain, which everybody wants high gain to get minimal distortion. I said, you know what? I want to make a low gain op amp. So when it when you use it, it sounds really open and it sounds nice and clear. And it did. You know, I mean, the Tone Lux stuff sounds fantastic. And, you know, I did the same thing when I did the 2500 with API. I didn't listen to anybody about the design of that compressor i did it the way i thought it should it should operate on drums and vocals and guitars and stuff and the only person that i showed the prototype to was shelly yakis and he said you only need one feature on that and you need a variable release because you've got to be able to make the release time bounce with the music and then he told me a story about the raspberries doing go all the way and how they practiced for two weeks and they were phenomenal. And the day they cut the record, they were really sloppy and it just didn't gel. When they took the masters to the record company, they pretty much rejected the record. And they said, you guys need to work some more. And they went back to the studio and somebody had plopped a couple of Roger Meyer compressors in the control room at record plant. And they patched the, the mix through the compressors and it turned out that 
they recorded the output of that because the bounce that the release time had basically fixed the song. And if you listen to that song on the radio, you can listen to that compressor bounce and it just like that dance stuff now that does that reverse yeah. compression. What's the song title again? It Go All the Way by the Raspberries. Awesome. And they took the tape, that tape, back to the record company the next day. And they were going like, my God, this is fantastic. You guys nailed it. Same band, same recording, same master tape. Wasn't even remixed. Just put through a couple of Roger Meyer compressors. And then Roger Meyer, they said, oh, they sound great. He took them back and then put them out in production. But he changed the release time. And so they never sounded the same again. And he said to me, he said, that did not have a variable release on it. It was set by him and it just happened to be right for that song. And you need to be able to have that control. So that's why there's that one variable knob and the rest are switches, but that one variable knob. And then I also figured out a way to do feed forward and feedback compressing, uh, compressing with one switch. Now everybody seems to do it, but I, I did it with a switch pan pot where you could pan between feed forward and feedback compression, which was really cool sounding. But those are, you know, and that's what, that's what he's referring to is the, you know, that, that what led me, what guides me. And it, to me, I look for two things. I look for not being in the way of the progress of the song. And I call that a groove buster. You know, when you do something that just stops everybody and you can see it on a singer's face you can when you when something goes wrong and he's in the middle of singing something and and the microphone preamp goes like that and he, he goes like this you just took him out of that zone and he, he might be able to get back into it he might not you know it depends so you don't want to be that guy and you also want to make things that don't take a lot of time to set up so one of the things I did with all the 200 modules with API was the gates and compressors. If you set the knobs to noon, that was a perfect starting point. It was like zero dB compression threshold. It was like a two and a half to one ratio, nice release time. Because if you notice, you know, when you go to a studio and as, as people are listening to this, this is the most valuable part of, of this thing. And I when I do classes up at Blackbird, I say the same, what's the most important thing? And I said, pay attention. Just pay attention. Don't distract yourself with anything. Watch everything that's going on because everything there is a lesson. You know, you see the picture of Al Schmidt lining a microphone. You go, oh, that's really cool. Al's setting up his own mics. D you know, who cares about that? Look at what he's doing. Why is he setting up his own mics? Because he's the mic settings. <laughs> because it's, he's adjusting him in such a way. Is he using a figure eight pattern and using that to cancel the symbols? You know, that type of thing. That's what you want to pay attention to. Yeah, it's a cool picture because it's Al, but it's like, that's not why Al's doing it. He didn't, he didn't do a photo op. He's doing it because he wants it perfect. So pay attention to why those guys are. Go out in the studio and look at how he's got the mic set up. Yeah, I can't count the times that an intern has gone out to set up a mic and they didn't even think that there were switches on the mic to set, you know, or there it's pointed up at the ceiling above the drums instead of down at the cymbals. Yeah. I mean, that's, those are the things. So when I would go into a studio, the first thing I would do is I would look at all the outboard gear, see how they got it all set up. And I would look at somebody when they say, Hey, we got a new compressor. They set it on the, on the producer's desk. They'd patch it in and he'd go, okay. And he'd turn around, he'd set everything to new and he'd go back and he'd adjust a couple things and listen to it. And then he would say, let's go. And so at that moment, if that thing didn't sound right, he would just say, you know, unplug it. And that's it. Your product's done at that point. You're out right. of it. That's why everybody makes old shit is because nobody has the sense in their in their wherewithal to do that. You got a couple companies that know how to do that. But a lot of these guys that are building stuff, they don't really understand why those things were the way. What are the numbers on 1176? What does that mean? What is the line mode on a 175 tube compressor? What is that for? Well, Altec made a passive equalizer. And you run a signal into the passive EQ and then run the EQ into the 175, put it on line mode, and now you got an output level control. That's how you made up the game. 
So, you know, those are the things that you look at. And I noticed when I when I first came out with the Tone Lux Mic Pre that had the Tilt EQ on it. One of the things I noticed, I went to visit Pat McMakin at Sony, and he was a, he bought the first 10. And I looked and looked at him, and every one of the tilt EQ was set at one o'clock. And it was just like it was just this little teeny lift in the high end, a little bit of cut in the low end, kind of shifting that energy up a little bit, made it a little bit clear, didn't destroy the sound of the instrument. And so I look at that, and I go, that's interesting because they were all set at one o'clock. And then every time I'd go into the studio, they'd always be set a little bit past zero. And so yeah. did you go back and redesign it so that the so zero was that zero? Yeah, I, I should have done that. Yeah. You click it in and you go, oh my God. Why well, didn't you, you know, just I, take 10 and make 10 one louder. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Well, it wouldn't be 11 then, would it? Um, so yeah, and it's interesting because the the original the the 550A always had a little bit of gain. Yeah, the one setting for the tilt. Oh, yeah, for the 550A. So the 550A was designed to look into a 600 ohm mic pre or a fader. Okay, so it had about a dB and a half of boost. When you didn't use the correct load on it, when you patched into a 550A, it always sounded a little better. So when I when I made all the stuff that I made, I made them all a dB hotter. They weren't unity in and out. They were always a dB hotter. So when you patch into them, they you got to go. Hmm. <laughs> and it would sound it would sound a little better. But you know what? That's kind of what people are looking for. And if you can give yeah. the engineer the confidence when he says, oh, I like that, then he's going to start out with a positive attitude with it. If you plug it in and it drops in level, he's going to go, oh, pull that out. Yeah. No, I understand that. I get beat up about stuff like that on my YouTube channel sometimes if I do a comparison. And then somebody goes, you really got to level match it. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. But but in your case, you're talking about that use case scenario where it's like the the confidence as an engineer in the studio is so important because it gives you, you know, when you're confident, you have, you know, 10 more great ideas to contribute to the project. And when you lose that confidence, all of a sudden you have minus 10 ideas to contribute, you know. And you that's so, going to bleed over to the performance. Yeah, just just a little bit. And I mean, you know, I, I assume maybe in a mastering situation, a mastering engineer might be more critical of of level matching. But uh, regardless, I mean. But that's, a, that's which fine. Era of he need, that's his about. job. Yeah. That's his job. Yeah. He needs to make sure that the levels are right. Yeah. But when I'm tracking or something, I want to go, ooh, that's nice. And then I'm going to play with it because I already know it's going to sound good. So I want him to be happy trying it because if he's if it drops in level, he goes, oh, I don't like that. And then somebody's going to say, so what'd you think about that new EQ that Paul Wolf did? Oh, it, it it just didn't have any punch. That's how quickly it all goes away. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've been there. I've been the one patching something in, and I just if it ain't great, if it ain't better, it's gone. And that's I why you said it. Myself. I always said it so that you set all the controls at noon and it was a good starting point instead of being yeah. something completely off. Yeah. It, you know, I, I've run into that with equipment where I've spent hours trying to get it to sound good because there was no reference, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, so let, tell us a little bit about fix audio designs and um, what's with this, you know, immersive analog console concept. <laughs> tell it's us about that. It's, it's insanity is what it is. Well, you know, I, I was doing design work for all these different people and the you know, stuff that you mentioned that we talked about. And I get a call from um, this guy named uh, Gregor Schweiger from Germany. And he wanted me to make him a surround console. So I had done a surround console with Thick or with Tone Lux, and I only sold two of them. One of them, the guy still has it. So I already knew how to do the left center right panning. And that's the most important thing is the left center right panning um, because it has to go in three in three locations. So um, I, I said, like a fool, I said, sure. And I um, I had no. I had no like concept of a module. I had no I, I had nothing. So that night I went in and I thought, OK, let's do this again. You know, um, so. You know, blah, 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 blah. Did all the features and stuff like that. And I sent it to him. I said, what do you think? He says, wow, that'd be perfect, you know. And I started refining it and stuff like that. And I wanted to make sure. One of the things that I've always done is I've never, I met, never made Tone Lux a clone of API. And I'm not going to make 
fix a clone of Tone Lux or API. I'm going to do something new. And that's a challenge. And that's where I, that's where, you know, Alex's comment comes back in because you, you have to come up with fresh ideas, you know? So I came up with something interesting. You know, I put a, I don't call it tilt because that's trademarked with, uh, with uh, uh, Tone Lux, but I call it the TQ. So every module has a TQ. Every module has a high and a low pass filter. Every module has an insert with a blend. All be summed together. Because I knew that people were going to be buying smaller consoles. So they still wanted to be able to, to do, uh, you know, 24 channels. You can do that. I've got a guy in Australia that has a master section and eight channels. And he says it's his best friend. Because he's got everything that he needs. He's, he can sum 24 inputs into it when he's mixing. It has the DAW loop so he can track while he's monitoring. Everything he needs is there. So, yeah, that's cool. And I mean, you know, I do feel like the modern studio is finding ways to keep that what's wonderful about analog and wonderful about a console and interface it with the computer world where, you know, the computer basically stole the console's job. Yeah, it did. Pro Tools stole the job of the console. Um, And but you but then you learn, you discover, wait, an actual analog console does all this stuff that I can't do in my computer. One of them is um real time in phase no latency summing you know it's also and, quick and it's parallel speed. stuff speed two channels at once that type of stuff unless you have a yeah. a raven or a controller you know yeah well just i mean like you know again i've talked about this before on the show but the thing that we just forget about is just the simple act of saying i'm going to take i'm going to take mics I'm, on the drums I'm, uh, pull up a drum mix but i'm going to send over to a compressor and send to a sans amp at the same time and blend those in all the things that I would do at my Bonnaroo <laughs> hay bale studio in real time yeah. that allowed me to mix really quickly and create a sound in the moment. And, uh, when we live in the pro tools, you know, the, the digital workstation, the computer world, we've accepted that, oh, well, we're going to get a sound now while we're tracking and recording, but we'll get a different sound later when we go mix. And in the analog world, it didn't have to be that way. You know, you can no. kind of get the mix sound while you were working. Yeah, you that's a, that's out. an important thing. That's that's one big thing. You kind of have to do that with, you know, I mean, you can do that with a DAW, just use two sets of faders, you know, kind of like you need an inline thing, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's one of the main things. The other thing is speed. Um, and there is, you know, there's, a, there's some glue. There's a lot of glue there in an analog console. I mean, that, you know, the stuff that Ronald Prent does on on his immersive console, when you hear it, it just sounds like it really sounds like you're there. When I hear immersive stuff, yeah, it sounds ambient and stuff like that, but it doesn't like emotionally pull me in as much as with Ronald stuff. I really like the immersive stuff. I have to say that it's moved it's moved the headphones away from your head, and it's given it some ambience. And you feel like you're in a room instead of having blasting going in your ears. Let's back headphones... up for a second, give an introduction. What is immersive? When we say immersive, what are we talking about? Immersive can there's... be anything. There's several formats. The main ones that are out there, of course, the Atmos format. Uh, there's the Sony 360 format, which is similar in a lot of ways. You have RO3D, which is 5.1 plus 4 in the ceiling, and then a, a VOG in the middle, Voice of God in the middle. Then you've got... There's a bunch of other ones that have four speakers that do phase positioning. Um, you know, there's a lot of formats, but those are the main ones, you know, that are out there. And they tend to, they allow you to put things in, in a space instead of in a, in a position. The, the, the fixed console does the same thing, except it's analog panning instead of phase panning. And then it gets converted into an object when it's, when it's rendered. And it, to me, it seems a little more positioned correctly.
Do you want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with examples from a Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Do you want to know how to master your own music at home? Rockstars of Mastering will show you how with plugins in your DAW so that your music will sound awesome when you finish your mixes. And if you're looking for a step-by-step -step solution for a pro-sounding mix that won't take years to learn, the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass with Craig Alvin will show you a proven method for creating Grammy-winning quality mixes that you can apply in your home studio right now. Or if you just need to learn the fundamentals of creating a great sounding mix, then register for my free course, Mix Master Bundle, to get great mixes using simple, free plugins. And get started now making your best record ever at recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy. Use the code ROCKSTAR at checkout to get 10% off any course for a limited time. Every studio needs a good vintage mic for that classic warm sound. Whether you're looking for those airy highs, sweet mid-range, or silky low end, a good vintage mic can put the magic in your mixes. So it's no wonder vintage mics have been loved and praised by thousands of engineers for decades. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia using only the best electronic components and feature the patented Golden Drop Capsule design for great detail and richness of tone that will bring that classic vintage vibe to your studio and be a real workhorse for your sessions. This time, our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to you, Rockstars. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR to get 40% off the Vintage Series mics V67, V47, and V12, the mic you're hearing right now, at jayzmic.com. With the analog, so if I if I understand Atmos, you've got you've got access to different speakers directly, or you've turned something into what's called an object, which lets you just kind of make it move around between any of the speakers, speakers. and then it's almost like later on down the chain, it converts that into okay, which speaker is this object in at this moment, kind of thing. And yeah, so well, you're that, able to do objects with an analog console. Well, you you. You typically you have your your bed, which is your 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 ground floor speakers. Those are going to be your main speakers because typically everything else is ambient. Now there's going to be some, you know, like in a movie, there's stuff going on overhead you. But music wise, it gets a little psychedelic. It's the trains running around a circle and quad. You know, you don't need that as much. Right. Um, so you can with the, with the console, you can snap. And you can do this in a DAW as well, but it sounds it just sounds completely different in a console. You can snap the channels to the speakers. So they come out of center, left, right, wide, left, wide, right, side, rear, ceiling, you know, whatever. You can snap them to those speakers. And that's basically what you do with the bed. My bed, my bed is seven one. So it's left, center, right. And then you can either do wide left and right, or you can do side left and right. Then you do rear. That's your seven one bed. And then you have your ceiling, which I do in quad. Okay. And there's a ceiling panner as well. And you can do floor to ceiling panning. All the music people right now, and even including the film people, they want music. They don't want nine one. They don't want seven one six. They'll bounce it down to seven one four because they just want the music. It's not moving around. It's not part of the it's not part of the movie. It's the music. Okay. So they all, you know, Netflix, everybody, that's what they want. 714. So that's what it boils down to. So that's why we did a 714 console. So that does 714. Now, if you decide that you want to have things moving around, like you want to have reverb over your head or something in the middle of those quad speakers, then you use the echo sends, which are basically just eight Q sends. But then you can assign those to an object. And then you take that object and you place it where you want it. So it's not really an object send, but we call it an object send because that's kind of what it's for. Because your bed is determined by the main panners, and then the, the sends are the objects. And so you can, and you can take, I mean, you can take, if you want to take, um, like Ronald does left, center, right, and then wide, left, and right. So he gets a bigger plane for the stage. So those, but the thing is, is the wide, left, and right, if you're dealing with speakers, 
those are going to be your left and right speakers. So it's never going to be wider than that. So he might take those wide left and right and make those channels objects coming out of those two channels, but make them objects and move them outside of the speakers. So he can, in your living room, he can widen your plane by taking left, center, and right, snapping it to the speakers, and then moving the wide left and right beyond the speakers and adding that ambience there. That's wild. Yeah, it is. And and it's very cool. I mean, it sounds enormous. And the, the nice thing is it isn't so in your face. When you put earbuds on, it's not in your face. It's it's moved away from your head a little bit. Yeah. All right. So let me back up. Um, one of the records that we've included that you did was a, a, a record with Jim Messina called In the Groove. It was a live album. It sounds great. It really sounds- It is a good record. It's a great sound, you know? Um, if you pictured yourself doing that record today and you had your <coughs> fix um, audio immersive console available, what would be some choices that you would make about how to record and mix an album like that? Recording would be the same. I mean, when we recorded that album, it was live. Um, I actually used a, the PreSonus console that had the input strip that went across the whole thing. That And that had a lot, there's a lot of features on that console that we used because that night I was doing front of house, I was tracking, I was sending a mono mix to the monitor guy mid side fills because when you stepped in front of the band, there was kind of a dead spot on the stage. So we put mid side fields there. I mixed that, I mixed the front row speakers and I sent a recording feed to um, a broadcast because we were streaming it and we filmed it. We filmed the whole show. So, so that was done on a digital console. That was done on a digital console, but the yeah, the I, mic pre. I, I thought it was done in like the 1970s on an analog board or something. No, it's just the way that we did it. We did a couple of things. We got Sennheiser to sponsor us. They gave us all the mics. And the one thing I learned was really interesting that I'd never experienced because we're all like, oh, I want to have this mic for this. Having all the same microphones in a live in a live setting like that, if I needed to pull 300 out of the front of house, it pulled it out of all the mics and it pulled it out equally. So they all sounded as good. There was a there was a glue that when you use the same microphone, the same brand, because they all all the brands have a color, they had the same kind of brand and it had the same effect so all the all the mics sounded like they belonged with the band the band and the mics everything sounded like it all was together interesting and, was, what, and what were the mics again are you said it was sennheisers this had 935 for the vocals we had all you know the the whatever the 609s the the, the ones you hang in front of a guitar amp mm -hmm. which are great because they don't take up stage space all that stuff their overhead mics the drum mics everything they gave us a whole kit for this record. They were one of the sponsors. And PreSonus gave us their floor monitors, which were really good. There was never, we didn't even have EQ on them. When we did the sound check, he, Jimmy's going like, and he's great when you do a sound check. He's like, he really knows his shit. And if the sound, if the monitor guy just follows him, he will have the best experience of his life. He had no, there was no EQ on the, on the monitors. None. They sounded just really good. And we had no feedback. The whole night. So it was, you know, it was a really incredible, um, uh, you know, recording process. And then we went into Jimmy's studio and we had, you know, 175s, we had Teletronics, we had a couple of GML parametrics, we had a massive passive, we had um, the very mu, we had uh, you know, a Lexicon 960 reverb, you know, a lot of Altec. That Eltec graphic, the red knob thing, we use that on the kick drum. A lot of a lot of classic equipment through a Tone Lux console during a session. And Paul McCartney popped his head in one time, and he was just like, "Oh my god!" You know, and he said, "It sounds really good." You got a compressor on the overheads, and he goes, "Yeah." He says, "Good," and then he left. He never saw him again. And he said, from that day on, he put a compressor on his overheads <laughs> every time, just because of that. But we I did we. It was like that. And so that record sounds like a record. I mean, it sounds huge, you know. But what it's about the what about the the recording? So so Sennheiser mics, 
And these are just like the built-in um, Studio Live well, console mic preamps? Or the something? Studio One mic preamps are really nice. It's a discrete analog mic pre. So that's a nice mic preamp. That's the PreSonus Studio Live console. They're, they're yeah. digital live. Okay, yeah. cool. But that was the that was the earlier one. It wasn't the one that had the digitally controlled mic pre's. It was the one that was had the analog mic pre's because the new one gotcha. uses the chip that does it. It's still analog, but it's the old that old one with that strip was really that that was one of my favorite consoles to be honest with you. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and I guess and that, you know it's cool to hear though because obviously a big part of it is knowing that you can get a you know capture a good recording, but then take it into a studio setting and mix it through an analog board later. And really bring back some of that, you know, it really does sound like the whole thing was done analog all along. You know? Well, I, you know, I mean, Jimmy's had a, you know, a little bit of experience in the studio, um, <laughs> you know, uh, me designing the console, knowing how it works and having my experience in the studio and stuff like that. Uh, we, we had a lot of fun mixing it. We spent a month doing it and it was done. We did a song a day. And we did a couple songs twice. You know, the usual thing, you get into the third song and then you kind of discover a groove. So you go back and do the first one two over again, you know, that kind of shit. We did a lot of, a lot of times if we were frustrated, we just said, let's go home, come back the next day and listen to it and go like, what were we thinking? You know? Yeah. So we spent the time to do that. And he's also just spectacular on editing. My God, the guy on Pro Tools, he just would not believe, I, you know? Nice. Yeah, he knows the shit like, the, you know, he's got the the color keyboard and he's just like splicing, moving, shifting things, you know, if something's a little off or he wants it a little off, you know, I mean, all that stuff. Yeah. He really knows his shit. He's really good at it. Um, That's the way to do it with Pro Tools. It's, it's, if you can just manually um, edit really well, it goes a long way. Oh, yeah. That. And we there was one song that he wanted a bass intro, just a like a three note, like, doo -doo -bah, you know, like that. So he went into the song, found the notes, brought them out, and put them in the right place, and lined them up, and da da da, and it was perfect. You know, it's just like. That's great. Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has not gotten you anywhere? Have you been looking for a simple or straightforward step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could learn that process from a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here's a quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. This was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. Look, when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and go check out Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick now for free. Well, we're just about at the end of our interview here, so let me let me ask you a couple more questions that I okay. wrote down. Um, what what to you is the craziest audio gear you or someone you knew created for a studio? I you know I look back at I don't know I look back at, at, at like when I did the vision, you know I did that with Jeff Bork and we. I look back at the picture of that thing and I just ask myself, who the hell designed that thing? You know, I, there's so, there was so, it was so complex. And then the same thing, you know, with, with Tone Lux, I go back and I go, that op amp and transformer, you know, who designed that stuff? And, I, and then the knob, I designed the knobs, I designed everything, you know. And then the same thing with this. I, I look at this, I mean, you know, you, the people can't see this, but this is the input module. You know, oh, one of the things I did is every single switch in this module clicks a relay. There it is looks no like audio. The starting frame from a Star Wars movie. Yeah, yeah like exactly. Like a the, city on an imperial on ship. ship or something. Yeah, it's like. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, there you go. That's it. <laughs> but every switch goes through a relay. So there are no ever. There will never be a bad switch. You know, and I, now I have a pick and place machine and I'm actually building the boards myself. I'm assembling them myself. 
I, you know, and I look at this stuff and I just, I take a step back and I go, who did this stuff? You know, because it's just the, this, I get in this stream of consciousness and I'm designing something and it's just going into the computer like this. And I'll stay up till three or four in the morning because I don't want to break that. I'm singing that song, you know, and it's like, it's the one and I don't, nobody wants to go home. It's like, no, no, no. If you want to do it again, we'll do it again. Yeah. Let's do that. You know? Yeah. And I'll go through that and I'll, you know, a week of that and I'll end up with something like, like this, this module that has, you know, six layers in the circuit board and it has, Every knob is, I designed the switch caps. They're custom switch caps. So they just light up. They don't, there's no switch. You don't see a switch. It just lights up a color. Otherwise it's off, you know, the same thing. I mean, it, but I, I just, I go back and I just go, where did this all come from? You know? Yeah. It's inspiration in the moment. It is. It's just like you get this thing, you get this fire going and you have to get it through. That's why you don't want to be the groove buster in a session. You don't want to, Say, oh, we gotta go, we gotta stop, or 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 let one of the things that Jimmy said is he never never tell somebody they could do a better job. Just say, that sounded really cool. You want to do another one? Do and then bring him back to the bad one. You know? So I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's just it's a it's a lot of fun. Like you said, I got a lot of shit that I still want to design. Yeah. So that's my next question. If you could make anything for audio, what would it be? I'm making everything I want. I, I've, I've got a new. I've got my new headphone amplifier. I just introduced. I've got the immersive console, which is insane in itself. But I've got, I've got three that I'm building right now, and I've got three that are out there. I've got the stereo module. I've got the blender. I've got uh, a Q system coming out. I've got um, a, a, a control room monitor system. It's you know this this thing right here. Cause you know, we discontinued the slate thing. So I'm doing a, my own fixed monitor now that has, cool. you know, a lot of the same features, Q talk back, different, lots of inputs. Um, you know, I've got, uh, uh the, the, the bucket, bring me the bucket. Bring I've got the, the bucket. bucket. Which, yeah. So it's got rack ears or a handle. You get the whole kit, you get ears, you get a handle, you get a power supply, you get jumpers, you get the knurled knob, the knurled screws that hold the modules in. You get all of that. And that's a 500 rack. Right? That's a 500 rack, which is, you know. Which you invented. Pretty much. It was actually Marvin Caesar that invented, you know. Nice. And I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, he he had it with Aphex and it was a different pinout. He was discontinued. I asked him if I could have it. And he said, here, here's the drawing. So I looked at it and made, put XLRs and 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 TT jacks on the back and uh, uh, fixed the power supply situation they had, redid the pinout. And then. Art Kelm kind of nicknamed it the lunchbox and it it started a cottage industry. I mean, when I bought API, there were three companies that made 500 modules. There was me, there was Troisi, who made this three-band compressor equalizer, which was really cool, like that, like the tube tech thing. Three-band compressor, you know, three knobs on each one. And then there was uh Apsi, who made the clickety clickety graphic the made this this EQ. You know, oh, and that oh was, yeah, the, like a sphere. Yeah, like a, like sphere. a sphere. And that was it. There were three companies. So we started, you know, we did, you know, we did the 500 VPR or the first rack because everybody used to build them out of Vero racks. The first rack, we'd had the lunchbox. I did the 500 VPR, which was two racks horizontally. Dave Matthews has probably 50 of those, you know? So, I mean, it was like we created this this like console that uses the industry that I helped to create. <laughs> All right, next question. Um, what problem exists in the studio that no one has been able to solve? Talent. <laughs> <laughs> I no, uh, you know what? Uh, I think that's one of the nicest things about this is we, you've got the studio guys and you've got the designer guys and the you know the studio guys complain about the thing i like to fix problems you know and so i get a lot of people sometimes they'll call me up and say god i'm just trying to do this is there a way to do that and i'll make them a little gadget box and send it to them you know barry rudolph does that he makes these little transformer boxes for people i just need it to be a little warmer well let me do this for you and you do that ah that's it you know so I like to be a problem solver and when people come to me and complain and i'm very insulative of feature creep 
don't tell me you need eight sends because I'm not going to do eight sends. I might do six. Now this console has eight, but like with the legacy, we had six echo sends and Dan Zimbelman, he had a great line. People would say, Oh, wow. Oh man. I, I really need to have eight. He says, we can do eight. It's a hundred, another hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> all of a sudden, and they would go. And all of a sudden, six was great. Yeah, well, I got. You know what? I think well, I could figure yeah. out how to use six. So when I did that, though, I made so the sixteen bus thing. Eight of those buses could be switched to the top two sends, because you've always got a main reverb and a main echo, and then maybe another main reverb, and then another one that that's shared, and then you start getting into individual things. You know, so your drums might be going to a reverb. Nothing else is going to use. So assign that to the last send and assign it to buses one and two and use that as your echo send for your that, you know. So those types of things are, I if someone says, you know, well, I want this, I go, well, you know, I'm not going to do that, but I can do this because I know. And that's the, that's the beauty of Ronald Print. He'll tell you, I want, I really would like to have this, but nobody will want that. But if you just did this, I think everybody would like it. And I do that, and everybody does. Awesome. Well, so, um, Paul, thank you so much for doing this interview with us. Uh, where can the rock stars go to learn more about Fix Audio, and um, where should they go? FixAudioDesigns.com. Dot com. Ta-da! And you guys have some cool stuff on there. you got videos showing off the um, the flanger and the doubler. Oh, yeah, again. the flanger doubler video is great. Uh, the... Uh, the Sunset Sound interview is good. I don't know if you yes. watched it, but I've had people. I've had people that say, "You know what? He watched the whole thing. It was so fun." <laughs> yes, that's an awesome interview. Sunset Sounds, a, what a classic place too. I was lucky yeah. to work there for a minute. Um, and then, of course, in the shop, you've got the bucket, you've got the collaborator, um, analog headphone monitor amp with talkback. That I was curious about. What is what is that box and how does the talk back how does how do you hook that thing up? It's got XLR in plus four stereo, and then it has a it has a TRS input that you can take your headphone out and go into headphone in. So it's just a bridge. And then it basically has it has um so it, it, it has, bridges to the next box. It bridges to this box, you know, my box, and then you have four headphone outputs. And each of those four headphone outputs has their own level control. And if you go, if you go from your headphone feed to my headphone feed, my box gives you about 6 dB more gain. So you can bump it up a little higher if you want. But each headphone amp, each headphone feed has its own power amp. Okay. And it's all it's all uh, discrete. It's it's analog. It's not a class D amplifier, but this this little the the little talkback mic on it, the little knob, and and the, there's a microphone. What that is for is so if you're if you and I are in the studio and we're writing a song together and we're recording our guitars, but we don't have an open mic, I can turn this room mic up and it just picks up the room. So we're as we're working, we can just talk, okay. If you're in, if you're out in the studio and you've got, you know, a lot of times when you have like a choir and you, you, you can't, it's like, you can't give everybody, you know, a mix. So you put four, four people on one thing and you bleed in the room. You can bring in the other people in the room so they can hear everything going on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it also has a foot switch that if you want to plug the foot switch in, so it's not on all the time you press it and you can talk and then you know release it but it's designed for collaboration that's why we call it the collaborator and it, it allows you to have work together in a quiet environment you know like in your apartment or your studio but you don't want to disturb anybody you open that up and you don't have to constantly pull your headphone off to go what what'd you say yeah yeah you know and that's what it's for and it's loud it it, it I, I had just sold into a guy in florida and he put it on um he put it on a drummer and the drummer actually had it out with him and turned the, the, the mic up a little bit and bled the room into his headphones along with the, the monitor mix and said it was amazing. It's a really cool box. Now we're coming out with a monitor can, a mixer that has eight inputs with each will have the TQ equalizer and a panner, and then it'll have four stereo in, or two stereo inputs. Uh, it'll have a, a quarter inch in. And then it'll have two headphone feed outputs. And those are for, you know, in the studio. And you can just bridge them together. 
with a D sub cable. Okay, and cool. yeah. So then some of the accessories we got, I mean, the bottom of this, the bottom of this thing has a, uh, a quarter 20 nut in the bottom of it. So you can use one of those mic stand to, you know, the, you know, those, the, the those little, uh, big to little adapters on the top of a it, straight stand. Yeah, but you know, like you have on uh, the camera, what do they call those? The, the yeah, hot the, shoe. The hot shoe that has a quarter 20 screw on it. So you can screw that into the bottom of this and just have it sitting on a stand. Yeah, know? that's the that's the jam right there. That's the ultimate headphone thing. It's just a straight stand with the heavy bottom. You can scoot it in close. There's your headphones. And you got to be able to hang the headphones up on the bottom. Well, th this doesn't have a hanger on it, but the headphone, the headphone mixer will have a hanger on it. Groovy. Yeah. Well, Paul, it's been a blast hanging out with you, dude. Thanks for hanging with us on Recording Studio Rockstars. It's great to see you. Um, what else should the Rockstars know about finding you online? Where else would you like them to go? And I do have one more question, actually. <laughs> Let me ask you this question first. I forgot right. to ask it. My goodness. All right. So this is our classic closing question for the podcast. It's hypothetical. But we're going to take the way back machine. And you go back and you find young Paul. Um Maybe you're doing live sound. Maybe you're just, uh, you know, in high school learning a little electronics, but you don't know what to do with it yet. And you go back and give yourself one bit of advice and you say, listen, dude, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you like to go back and give yourself if you could? Um, well, that's what I basically did is what I tell everybody at the end of every class is pay attention. It's the most valuable thing you have. And it, it, it's everything. And when you do that, if you use that, you find yourself driving better. You find yourself in better relationships. You find yourself doing a better job in the studio. You know, you're not in the way of people. If you, if you look like you're in the way, you're in the way, move, you know, go somewhere else, you know, uh, just pay attention. And if you notice that it's a very quiet session, don't open your mouth. If someone wants your opinion, they'll ask you for it, but pay attention. That is, it's free. You know, it's like, it's free. It's like, all you have to do is just listen, you know, because it's all there. It's free information, you know? I mean, Tom Fly did American Pie because the engineer that was doing it was sick. And the record company said, if you don't turn it in today, we're not, we're not going to release it before Christmas. So he mixed that song. It made his career. Wow. And then he that. went on to do Tower of Power, Sly the Family Stone, Rick James, you know, that's how that kind of, Steve Marcantonio assistant engineer john ledden sessions and all of a sudden yep. the, you know they say hey we want to cut this song the engineer's already left hey steve can you uh, just pull something up we want to lay this down we just got this idea and all of a sudden it's like wow i like this guy because he kept his fucking mouth shut and they learned to like him <laughs> and now <laughs> they like him Wait, and now he's I'm the sorry. guy he is. more love to steve but steve kept his mouth shut <laughs> well now he doesn't <laughs> and you can love tell him i said that love you, steve. Yeah, um, and that's awesome, not dude. gravy, it's sauce. Whatever. I don't care what <laughs> exactly. I gotta have Steve come back on the show, man. Oh, awesome. he's great. Yeah, yeah, you should get a spot on there. <laughs> we, yeah. We right, go right. way, way, way back. And it's just like it's just this on and us like, oh, come on. You you really said that, you know, that kind of stuff. That's, that's great. All right. So I had interrupted you before. So um <laughs> fixaudiodesigns.com. Um, anything else you want people to go check out uh, if they want to find out more about you or just reach out to you with their next brilliant studio design? The idea? website. So I answered all the emails as I did at the beginning of this. I answered an email from a guy in, in like Latvia, you know. So, I mean, I'm, you know, whatever. I'm available. I don't like to be somebody that isn't, you know, isn't in touch. You know, I want to know what people think. I want to know what people want. You know, so awesome. Well, um, Paul, thanks so much for hanging with us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Um, I look forward to seeing you in person again soon, and, and uh, we'll see you around the studio, dude. Love you. Don't ever change. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my 
my free course at MixMasterBundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to RSRockstars.com slash email. Again, that's RSRockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Spectra 1964, Jay-Z Microphones, Adam Audio, Solid State Logic, and Isotope. Remember to use these coupon codes for special discounts. At isotope.com slash rockstars, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription for access to many plugins. At jzmic.com, use the code ROCKSTAR for 40% off the V47, V67, and V12 microphones. That's what you're hearing my voice on right now. At recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy, use the coupon ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course for a limited time. If you enjoyed Recording Studio Rockstars, then please check out our sponsors using the link in our show notes because it's a great way way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio, and they're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.